Hello everyone. Today we're going to look at negative feedback, a very important concept when it comes to operational amplifier circuits. So there's two kinds of feedback. There's negative feedback and there's positive feedback. Both of these are useful in electrical circuits. Negative feedback involves stability. And positive feedback will basically turn into instability. So examples in everyday life. Positive feedback is what we get when a public address system feeds back. You hear that squeal. Negative feedback is a process of stability sort of maintaining a set value. They both require a signal, some kind of information, being taken from the output and sent back to the input. With negative feedback, there's an inversion involved. In other words, an opposite action. So a good example would be driving down the highway and you're trying to keep a set speed. Maybe, let's say, 65 miles an hour. If you see on the speedometer that you're going a little slow, you do the opposite. You put your foot on the gas pedal to go a little faster. If, on the other hand, you see you're going 70, again, you do the opposite. You take your foot off the gas pedal to slow down, to bring you back to 65. So you're settling right around that set point, 65. That's what negative feedback does. Now, in the case of amplifiers, negative feedback has... Um, a bunch of, of good things that happen. And I like to use the acronym Big D. The B stands for bandwidth. The I for impedance. And this involves both the input and out, output impedance of the amplifier. G is gain. And D is distortion. So what happens here? Basically, you are going to give up gain. The gain is going to go down. That's okay, because as we'll see with these op amps, we have more gain than we need. What we'll get in return is an increase in bandwidth, right? So a wider range of frequencies. We'll get a decrease in distortion, another good thing. And then we have control over the input and output impedances. We can either have these things go up or down, depending on how we configure the circuit. Well, that's great because, you know, if I'm interested in sensing a voltage, I want the input impedance to go up. If I'm interested in sensing a current, I want it to go down. I want an ideally small value. If I'm looking for a an amplifier to be modeled as a voltage source, I want it to have a really small output impedance. And if I want it modeled as a current source, then I want it to have a really high output impedance. So we have control, right? And it turns out the more you give up, in other words, the more gain that you sacrifice, the more you're going to get back. Okay? Beautiful kind of idea, right? The more you give, the more you get. All right. The basic configuration can be broken into four sort of sub-configurations. We can combine the feedback network, either in series or in parallel, with the input and the output. So, very basically speaking, if I have an input over here, what I do is I sum the input signal. Here's my input back here with this feedback signal. So here's my amplifier. This, you know, is my output over here. And I'm going to tap off of that and send signal back. So notice the arrow back into this summing node, but inverted, right? So I've got plus over here and minus over here. And this feedback network has some characteristic, kind of like gain, right? A, we call that beta. 
So as I said, there's four ways we can connect this. We can, we can connect this up either in series or in parallel. So that's series parallel on the input, series or parallel on the output. So that's four possible configurations. We can have, for example, series on the input. I'll do it like this in out. Series on the input, parallel on the output. Now what that will lead to, generally speaking, a series connection is going to give you an increased impedance. Just think like series circuits. You know, you add elements, you get more resistance. So a series connection, whether it's input or output, increases impedance, parallel decreases impedance. So a series in, parallel out connection has uh, a high input impedance and a low output impedance. Right, so the Z in versus Z out is high, low. Now, a high input impedance is associated with something that's voltage sensing. And a low output impedance, like a source, right, is associated with a voltage source. So the appropriate ratio between input and output would be voltage to voltage. In other words, uh, a V out over V in configuration. So this actually turns into an ideal voltage amplifier. We will see a very, very large input impedance, a very, very small output impedance. Right? An ideal voltage amplifier. So there's going to be a characteristic A, obviously, A sub V. Now, in contrast, if we uh, completely flip this, if I went parallel series rather than series parallel, uh, we would have a low input impedance and a high output impedance. So a low input impedance would be associated with a current sensing device and a high internal impedance for a source would lead to a current source. So that's I out versus I in. And this would be an ideal current amplifier. So it would also have a gain, uh, you know, A sub I. And then we have two more. We have series, series, which is high for both input and output, which means it has uh, voltage sensing on the input because it's a high impedance, and a high internal impedance would mean current output. So that's an I out over V in. So this is, in fact, a transducer, right? It's going from, from a voltage to a current, OK? Voltage to a current. Well, we have a name for that. That's transconductance. So we call this a transconductance amplifier, right? You could call that a, um, a voltage-controlled current source, right? This would be a voltage-controlled voltage source. This would be a current-controlled current source. This would be a voltage-controlled current source. Now, we saw something like that in uh, semiconductor devices, which is... Um, a JFET or a MOSFET, right? That's modeled as a voltage controlled current source. So we're going to be able to make an ideal version of that. And then the last one that we have is the parallel parallel. Okay, so that's uh, parallel on the input would be low impedance. Parallel on the output would be low impedance. So again, um, with a low input impedance, that would be current sensing. That's an I in, but it's got a low output impedance. So again, as a, as a source, that would be a voltage source. So that would be V out over I in. And we call that trans resistance. All right, so this is a current controlled voltage source. So a trans resistance amplifier. All right, so to reiterate, we got a, a voltage controlled voltage source, ideal voltage amp. We have a um, current controlled current source ideal current amp, a voltage-controlled current source, so that's a transconductance amplifier, right? The characteristic is not a pure number, right? This has units of Siemens. These two are pure numbers because it's volts over volts, amps over amps. This, however, is amps over volts, so Siemens. And then finally, we have a current-controlled voltage source, the trans-resistance amplifier, and this has a unit of ohms. Okay? Great. Now, we need to define a couple more uh, characteristics here. And that is if we look at the amplifier itself, take a typical op amp, 
we can plot a gain characteristic, right? Now we need to de to uh, delineate between the gain of the amplifier itself and the gain of the system. Okay, so the gain of the op amp by itself we call AOL. It stands for a open loop. By open loop we mean breaking open the feedback loop. And then a CL is a closed loop, all right? Feedback. So you think of ACL as gain with feedback, and this is gain without feedback, or you know, isolated, however you want to think of that. So if we just plot the gain of the amplifier by itself, typical op amp, let's see here's our gain over here, right? This is basically a open loop I'm gonna do. We get something that goes like this. Now we know it's high, right? We already talked about that. It could be 100,000, 200,000, 300,000. It's a big number. This, of course, will be plotted in decibels. Comes up way up here, so like I said, maybe 100 dB. Let's just throw a number out. And then it breaks off and it kind of goes like this. And it starts to fall off. So down here is 0 dB. Now this break point that we see, this, this, basically this lag network, this frequency is not particularly high. It might only be 100 hertz, 100 hertz, I repeat that. And this slope is a single order slope. It's a 20 dB per decade slope, right, 6 dB per octave. So as we go up, if we started at, let's say, um, 100 dB, right? Every decade we drop 20 decibels. Well, if I started at 100 hertz, right, we'd be at 80 dB at 1 kilohertz, 60 dB at 10 kilohertz, 40 dB um, at 100 kilohertz, so on and so forth. Where do we cross unity? In other words, where's our gain zero dB? Where is it one? Well, you know, a typical op amp, this frequency well, a 741 is 1 megahertz. Um, you know, the uh, like 351, 411, those things are a few megahertz, you know, say 3, 4, 5 megahertz in that region. Faster op amp like a 318, uh, that's maybe 15 megahertz. But you can buy op amps where that unity gain frequency, as we call it, might be hundreds of megahertz. It could be 500 megahertz. But our general purpose devices, they're pretty small. So that's what we look at for, um, for an open loop response. All right, now, compare that. When we add feedback, we are going to reduce gain. So when we look at the gain with feedback, right, the A closed loop, which I'll do in this lovely purple lavender kind of color, that might look something like this. It might be way down here. Okay, maybe this is only 20 decibels now, instead of the original 100. Uh, graphically, you can see how the frequency where it starts to bend, where it starts to drop off, um, has gone up, right? What we were talking about over here. Exactly how that works, we'll talk about in a future video. But we have obviously a, a reduction in gain. Now, the important thing that I want to bring out here is the difference between these two things. The space between them, right? This space here, which we can see is decreasing. That stuff in red is called the loop gain. Another way of looking at it is, this is the sacrifice factor, S. Now, sacrifice factor is essentially defined as the difference between your um, closed loop gain and your open loop gain, right? That would be in a bell form, um, and typically, we'll either call it S prime or more typically, loop gain. 
So I would say it's um, my open loop gain in decibels minus my closed loop gain, right, again, in decibels. Or we could do it as a ratio in ordinary gain. We can say that S, plain S, not S prime, is um, your open loop gain, non-decibel, divided by your closed loop gain. So, you know, just to throw numbers out, like I said, if, if uh, this was 100 dB back here, and this thing with, with the feedback was 20 dB, okay, in ordinary form, that would be 10 to the fifth, and that would just be 10. Right? Remember, it's 20 dB is a factor of 10 for voltage. Um, so, I would say the loop gain, at least at these lower frequencies, would be 100 minus 20, or 80 dB. All right, so that's an 80 dB of loop gain there. All right, just the difference. At a higher frequency, it could be considerably less, right? It could be 40, could be 15, right? All depends on where we measure it. Or we would talk about the sacrifice factor in ordinary form, in which case we would say, well, that's 10 to the fifth divided by, you know, an ordinary gain of 10, so that's 10 to the fourth. Right. Of course, 10 to the 4th in decibels for voltage is 80 dB. It's the same number. So we talk about it either way. Sometimes it's convenient to talk about it in decibels. Sometimes it's uh, convenient to talk about it in ordinary form. Here's the, here's the real kicker. As we will see, the uh, change in bandwidth and impedance and distortion ideally changes in accordance with S. So... If we sacrifice gain by a factor of 100, then my distortion, and by distortion I mean static forms of distortion like total harmonic distortion, THD, that'll go down by S. That'll go down by a factor of 100. So if it was 10%, after feedback, it's only going to be 1 one-hundredth of that. It's only going to be a tenth of a percent. You know, we're approaching high phi now. Um, so the bandwidth is going to grow by a factor of 100. The input and the output impedance can either increase or decrease by a factor of 100, you know, all depending on which of these four configurations we've created. But basically, that's the trade-off, right? We trade off gain by a factor of S, and in return, we get a reduction in distortion, an increase in bandwidth, and a change in input and output impedance, also by a factor of S, okay? Oh, beautiful. Now what we want to do is kind of look at some of these configurations and um, see how they work. It turns out that, you know, from a lot of our work, um, you know, we're interested in voltage output. Not everything, but in many circuits, that's what we're interested in. So the two sort of biggies that we look at are the first one and the last one the series parallel and the parallel parallel. So the series parallel is an ideal voltage amplifier, right? High input impedance, low output impedance, and we come up with a stable gain characteristic of V out over V in. Parallel parallel um, is modeled as an output voltage, but it senses input current. Now, as you will see, with a slight alteration of the circuit, basically by adding one resistor, we can have this thing turn into voltage sensing and we get another kind of voltage amplifier it has slightly different characteristics than the series parallel most notably this is an inverting configuration and this one is a non-inverting configuration but they're both useful All right so we're going to primarily focus on these two things uh, these other ones the current output versions the i out versions not used quite as much um, so we're not going to spend nearly as much time on them, although they are fully detailed, as, at least as much as you need, um, in the text. So we can look at it there. So our next thing to look at is, in fact, going to be the series parallel, right? I'll show you some nice shortcuts on how this works, and there are some surprising, rather surprising outcomes when we start uh, analyzing, coming up with formulas for closed loop gain. See you then.